Okay, so we're going to be talking about income streams. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome back Kate Friesen. You may uh, remember her from this morning. Um, and we have two new people that have joined us, uh, James Culleton and Andrina Turin. Thank you so much. Uh, I wonder if maybe we could just go down the line, uh, introduce yourself and what kind of um, artistic work you do, and maybe a little snippet about what you've been up to lately. I think you should start. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrina Turin. I am a singer and a musician uh, and an artist, and I work primarily in music, but I have uh, diversified into other fields in the last few years. I toured in a band for nine years called Shikamin, and before that I was touring in another band, and now I've got a solo project, and um, since June, since actually March of 2021, I have been working on a solo record, which will be coming out next year, um, in, hopefully in the spring, uh, and working on a whole other things. I do some voice acting, I do for animated series for children, and I... Um, do other visual arts, but more just so on a personal practice. Um, that's, yeah. I'm uh, from St. B over the bridge, far, <laughs> from a land far, far away. And yeah. That's it. Wonderful. Great to have you here. Thanks. Uh, I'm James Galton, an often collaborator with Andrina Turan. Mm -hmm. I also live in St. Boniface. Uh, I'm a. His, as far as income streams, I'm a furniture designer, artist, musician. That's probably how it would, and even musician, I, maybe that's a <laughs> performer, but I love them all. And uh, I think as I was making notes for this, um, the idea that you diversify your income um, is hugely important. And uh, so for me, furniture design uh, ends up being passive income of every time someone makes a sofa, I get a little money in the mailbox. And I think a passive income source is super important. Um, I just did something for the Property Brothers. Uh, I almost met them at the last show. <laughs> I don't know if you, these guys are like six foot six. They're giants. They're, is um, it the, tw the twins? The twins, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that was, yeah, that was weird. Um, <laughs> and then um, I guess as an artist, uh, I've been into public art lately a lot. I just installed a big steel ox cart wheel in St. Anne, Manitoba, which was anxiety filled, but it's in the ground and it's there. So that's good. Um, and then as a, as a performer, uh, I just released a kids album called super fun and, uh, been hanging out with Al Simmons a lot as one does. And, uh, yeah, so I think it's the, um, for me, being able to do all those things and then have my own time um, to do whatever I want, like go for breakfast with Andrea, um, <laughs> that's uh, key. Wonderful. Thanks for being here. Have a good brunch. <laughs> <laughs> I live on this side of the river, but I do go on the bridges. <laughs> um, I, you, you already, I was in, uh, introduced this morning. Um, and so the source of my work is story. And uh, the thing that I love best is to be a catalyst for other people to discover and tell the stories they need to tell. And to do that, I weave in everything I learned as a performer, as a journalist, um, as uh, somebody who's freelanced most of my life. Um, and the work comes out in, in many different ways. Sometimes it's like this morning during a keynote, um, Workshops is one of my favorite things to do. I coach, um, I teach. And uh, when people call me up and say, do you do this thing? I, I never say no before I think maybe I could do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that has brought me down some really, really interesting paths. Very cool. Um, I think uh, as we move forward, just as a reminder to people in the room, if you do have questions, feel free to just put up your hand and we can answer as we go. We have some questions we are going to cover, but if something pops up for you, please feel free to, to ask that. And same with you at home, folks, uh, pop into the chat and ask the question and uh, it can be uh, passed over to us and then we can uh, handle it as a team. Um, so uh, I guess to start, uh, has your artistic practice changed at all? during the pandemic, because of the pandemic? Uh, if so, how, why? 
Okay, I'll do it first. This time. <laughs> yes, 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 that's yeah. great. Um, totally, mm. and 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 yet the the core of it is the same. Um, two ways. Uh, one one way is all my work was in person before, and uh, I really put a lot of work and got a lot of guidance. I was really lucky to to have people help me out a lot with how to make um, an online experience as fulsome but different. It's like apples and oranges, but to really make it um, different. And the, one of the gifts about that is that my the people that I work with are from all over the place. I just finished working with a group of young women in Ghana and Toronto because I could do it online and because they knew about me because I was doing work online. So it's brought me many, many rich experiences. Um, and the other way that it's really changed is I've spent a lot more time on my own. And if any of you know know me, um, I'm a real extrovert and I love people and I'm super socially motivated. So the pandemic was really hard at the beginning. And then what I found is that it reminded me about space and that creative space. And I started to play more again, and I hadn't played in a long time. So now whenever I get a contract, I give myself time to play. And I go, I have this contract, but I'm gonna play. And I'm gonna play for a day or a half a day. And I, nothing has to come out of it. If I wanna go Google whatever I wanna do, I can. If I wanna draw, which I've started to do, and I'm not, I'm not a good drawer, if I wanna walk, whatever it is, and it always feeds the work in a really mysterious, interesting way. So I've been remembering how to be creative in everything I do. Yeah. Very cool. Um, in um, in the furniture world during the pandemic, everyone took all the money that they were spending on traveling and spent it on furniture. So oh. my royalties went, you know, and now they kind of were at the bottom of the valley again. But uh, in that sense, my practice changed where I had to do less because of passive income. Mm -hmm. But um, I did find that I was teaching online lots and trying to build connections that way. Um, in order to see people, I would find reasons to collaborate with them. And, and so I think my, my list of collaborators got bigger, which I think... Um, like if I, if I don't feel good about some animation I'm doing, okay, I need to find an animator. If my welding is really ugly, <laughs> I'm going to find somebody who can weld better than me. And I think during the pandemic, that was a big thing, even though working from home, you know, I was trying to find ways to make contact with people, but also I was able to scale up a lot of projects because I wasn't afraid to ask for help and collaborate. Um, and then there were lots of musicians who were um, not touring. And so I was able to actually record more music and even help out a few of my friends uh, with getting them some money for projects. Um, and I also hired a grant writer for the first time. I found after, uh, you know, a hundred rejection letters so many which, of which where I started to laminate my rejection letters and I <laughs> making a suit of armor to protect me from further rejection. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to get used to the fact that for every 20 things you apply for, maybe you'll get one and, and not feel bad about it. But um, hiring a grant writer made me realize, well, I can write a grant, but can I write a grant that inspires people? You know, and the writer was able to do that for me would take a, a line of mine that just sort of told you the basic facts of something and romanticized it, made it exceptional. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, uh, yeah, that was what I learned. Arguably, there's a lot of positive in that. It mm -hmm. sounds like, like being able to make connections with people that you hadn't previously because even the logistics of like going to meet somebody or like taking up meetings in a whole day. It's like, you could have five at home. You could connect with a bunch of different people. Anything you'd like to? What's the question? <laughs> uh, what, yeah, did you see any uh, changes to your artistic practice right. during the pandemic? Okay, so in 2015, a band that I had toured in for almost nine years, 
um, stopped touring and I had been managing that band and, uh, and, you know, doing all the logistical stuff. And so when the band sort of dissolved, I felt a little bit burned out about with the industry side of things. And I always knew that I wanted to make a solo record, but I just did not feel in the right headspace. And I really wanted to allow time to explore that. So at that time, 2016, 2017, I started writing music for um, theater productions. And I did, I was a one woman band in the show at the National Arts Center. That was a four month, um, four month term. And then we played the show over the course of the next two years. Mm -hmm. And that really was amazing because it felt like I was rediscovering who I was as an individual. I was recapping into talents. You know, I, I was a percussionist in high school and I played a little percussion in my band, but then I was like, just really exploring all those things that I used to do and reminding myself of the talents that I had outside of the ones that I had been really hyper-focused on for the last decade. Um, so that was like a, a good, a good, reminder to myself and I guess so when the pandemic came I had already been working in um, composing and I had done a few soundtracks for different short films or small documentaries and really was getting into this world of recording at home already um, when the pandemic came by chance just before I had bought myself a mirrorless HD camera because I was tired of having 10,000 pictures on my phone that don't mean anything that I'll probably never revisit. So I was like, I'm going to be intentional about photography. And then when the pandemic hit, it was like I had all the tools that I needed to, you know, that famous word pivot my, my craft online and to be able to offer shows and to be able to participate in things. So I spent a great deal of time sort of learning more how to do that and recording myself audio through my Logic Pro and through my microphones and then uh, doing the videography and making sure lighting was good and everything and then editing them together. And I just had a really good time learning how to do all that. And I know not everybody enjoyed that, that pivot, but for me, it was fun and it was challenging and it was things that I kind of already wanted to do. And, um, you know, on a non-creative side, during the pandemic, I, I got a job being an administrator for Union Nationale Métis, which is the French Métis Union um, here in Winnipeg since like the 1800s, uh, 1887, it was started here. So this is an organization that's very grassroots, not-for-profit, and has endured a, a whole century uh, with no funding and nothing. And they just had got this grant, um, operational grant from the government for three years, but there, the, the office wasn't done anything. So I, at the time, was the vice president. I resigned and then I took this administrative job, which I was like, I don't know if I can do this. But what it taught me was that everything that I taught myself how to do administratively in my career as a musician was totally transferable to, you know, a more regular uh, type of work mm -hmm. and I was I was so impressed to be like wow these are actual real awesome skills to have and I could do the spreadsheets and do this and so I mean that it, it, it was good for sustainability financially during that time but also just like reinforcing my confidence in my administration and business entrepreneurial skills I guess and then what the, because as James was saying during the pandemic, all the musicians weren't touring. So as I had been planning to do this record forever, I always was like, will I do it in Montreal with this group of friends I have? Will I go to Moncton where my friend has a studio? Will I go to Louisiana where I have friends? Like, where will this happen? How will it happen? How will it come together? Now we're in a pandemic, nobody's leaving. And I live alone. I actually was born in St. B, but I live in the North End. I love the North End. And uh, I live alone, so during the height of the pandemic, I, as a solo person, could have two people come to my house, which was my good friend Brad Siemens and Damon Mitchell, who I've played music with for 25 years. So all of a sudden, we are thrown into this feeling of feeling like we're 15 again, where playing music is this real outlet and it's just this real way to like express ourselves and you know there's not much live music there's no live music happening and there's none of those connections happening so it felt like a, a strange time warp you know where we're just like in a basement making music till 
one in the morning and we had a weekly regular thing they would come every Wednesday and we took each of my songs and just built them up as a trio because they're multi-instrumentalists and so am I and so we just with what we had made my record basically and then I started writing the grants and then I recorded um, still throughout the pandemic so I think you know I think I was going to make a record but I don't know that it would have been this and for me the, the experience of having made it it makes it already successful for me because it was like so rich and so powerful and such a, a, a beautiful expression of art. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm still working towards putting that out because I've been busy doing a lot of other things at the same time and I'm only one person now, but I think the pandemic also taught me to just like slow down and not work in this constant frenzy of like, I must do this, I must do this, go, 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 go. It's just like, I feel better and more productive and like my art means more when I just slow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, with the kind of the uh, shock of free time that uh, a lot of us experience, did you take any special training? Were there any workshops that you participated in? Was there anything that you kind of like used to like either take on new skills, artistic or otherwise? Your turn. <laughs> You're a good delegate. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, don't. Um, <clears throat> I found that my um I realized I wasn't going to be doing a lot of traveling. And so I shifted a lot of what I was doing to teaching online and to the point where I, I had scheduled like little half hour kind of like half hour classes throughout a week, and there were like 30 of them. And it was kind of like it's madness, but it was really interesting to just operate like that in your home with all, and meeting these people online. And then when you eventually you saw them in the flesh, it was like, <laughs> wow, you're, you're not two dimensional. Like, I mean, it was like, it was very strange. The people you thought were six feet were only like five feet, <laughs> things like that. But I think the, I got better at zoom. Um, and I actually did this one uh, and trying to be creative with the, the tool. I did a video of my studio where I would sit during these sessions and uh, I, I videotaped myself kind of popping my head up and like walking in behind. And then I used that video as a backdrop to, <laughs> and I green screen myself. So I would sit very still and then my, myself would come in and I'd be like, you know, and I, I freaked out so many students with that video. I, I've since lost it when we I up, upgraded Zoom, but um, it was you could still have fun with with the method. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just trying to think of the if I took any workshops or anything. But um, I found I was taking jobs that I normally wouldn't, mm -hmm. um, and wasn't afraid. Like the way you talked about that sort of, you know, hey, do you want to do this? It wasn't a it wasn't an immediate no or a calculation. It was like like I remember someone asked me to make a. 10 foot tall pink flamingo made of golf balls. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Or a, a, a World War II replica of a Jeep full size made of styrofoam to hang in, in Princess Auto. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think I've, like sometimes you have so much business that you can say no to things. Mm -hmm. But when you start up, I like, I wouldn't be afraid of trying everything. Like I know I've tried textile design, I've tried showroom layouts and things, and 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 I don't enjoy doing that as much as upholstery design. But I know when I was starting up in that first, it's like that first five year segment of uh, of starting your own business. Um, there's you're like really running fast and working hard and taking as many things as you, taking as many attempts at things as you can. Um, and I think that's important, you know, but that's not sustainable. Like I'd say like three to five years, you do that. And then you can be a little more discerning. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know if you take any yes. deep dive into like new skills, classes. Well, I think I mean, what was cool is that a lot of different things were popping up. I knew Manitoba Music was doing a lot of panels online. Uh, and I jumped into a few programs, like learning more about the UK market and learning more 
about things that I knew weren't going to be skills I was going to use immediately, but that I would serve me in the future. And um, <clears throat> I did I did a super deep dive into my own accounting because I felt like over the last five years, my income streams had diversified so much. And I was like, for the first time in my life, actually making a living wage, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is Yay. <laughs> um, but, you know, I I, um, I really sorted out QuickBooks. I took a bunch of training on how to like really organize myself. I, I'm a maker too. So I make, I make things and I've done a few craft sales. Um, I do a side vintage business. I do music. And so like all of these things, how do I look at them globally and know where everything comes from? And then when I get grants, how do I know how much I've spent of the grant and where it's gone and how much goes in this stream and how much goes there? So I feel like I always was able to function at a, at a decent level maintaining all of that, but then I really wanted to just feel confident and good at it. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time um, using that side of my brain um, during the pandemic just to to sort of anchor myself a little bit more for for the world opening back up and then jumping back in and having less time to figure those things out. Yeah. So I think that was like a priority for me, but otherwise I think I just allowed myself like, because I've been always a singer and a musician, it's been really hard to say that I'm an artist or that I do visual art because I feel like in high school, we had to choose art or music. You couldn't do both. They were at the same time. And so I chose music, but then I never shaded the pair in art class. So I was just like, I'm not an artist, you know? But then I, I really value that. And as a form of expression, it's just, I feel like I just gave myself permission to just do it and just maybe not to classify it or to put a label on it or whatever, but just to do it. Because I remember being, feeling so free to do it before. And then we just kind of box ourselves into these roles that, we feel limit us to only that. And so that was a nice part too. And it wasn't really any formal training, but it was like pulling out those books I bought at the thrift store a dozen years ago that was like how to draw um, an old barn in a field. And I was like, well, you know what? Today I'm going to make use of that $1 purchase. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it sounds like you really invested in yourself in that time. Yeah, and just like, because it's so anxiety feeling too, like everything's, and I live alone with my dog. So it was just really important to just allow time, like you said, for play, for relax, for, for enjoyment, for an outlet to bring a little brightness to the day, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for yourself? Um, I feel like with the pandemic, uh, and how many things went online. There is so many cool things you can learn online. So part of it is deciding which. Mm -hmm. um, but I've taken like just these little courses. Some of them were free. Some of them weren't that expensive. Like in how to light myself better. I moved. I ended up moving my computer so that I had the window coming with the light towards me. Like I learned that in this little mini course on, on videoing. Um, currently, I'm really on high zoomies I'm really in my work having to do this very thing where I run a workshop and I have zoomies and roomies as I just learned that expression <laughs> however you want to use it but that how to make the power balance how do how to uh, make it uh, a balance of power um, between the people who are in the room and the people who are in another room not like like not a negative but in in a equalizer. And I found a great free workshop last week on that. So I feel like there are so many interesting things to learn and having a learning mindset all the time is, I think, part of, I'm hoping I will always have that learning mindset. And there's two little things I want to pick up on, like uh, what you said about, about starting that admin job and then finding out you had all those skills. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing thing about, like, um, I really feel like there's all these skills you can take laterally and just start thinking about how you can move these skills laterally. So I went from working as a solo singer songwriter. So I learned how to executive produce and fundraise for CDs. Like you learn how to fundraise, you learn how to write grants, you learn how to book gigs, like all those things are business skills. Mm -hmm. So when I went to CBC, I'd never had 
a, what I call a job job. I, besides the first nine months where I was in a occupation, occupational therapist and then I quit I'd never had a nine-to-five job so I went into that nine-to-five job and I went oh have you thought about doing things differently some people at CBC love this some people hated it <laughs> but what I became there was the startup gal like people would like I started shows I executive produced shows I launched new things because I knew how to do that from being a musician so when I left that job and went back into doing something totally different, my business now with story, I took all those things. And so never feel like you're starting over because there was that moment, I was 54 when I left CBC and I went, oh man, I wish I would have started this sooner and now I'm starting from scratch. You're not starting from scratch. And I remember having this freak out because I was doing this fairly high level keynote um, and I called a friend of mine uh, and I said, like, I just want to pay them back. I don't want to do this because I've never done this kind of a big keynote before. And she said, hello, Kate, were you on main stage at the Winnipeg Folk Festival? Yes. <laughs> Was that more people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she reminded me that all those other skills that I have. And she said, you're not you're not two years into your business. You are at that point, 56 years into your life. You have, you take all those things. So that sense of lateral skills, just keep doing that. And then the thing around trying stuff, um, I agree, like, especially when you're starting out to take stuff that'll stretch you, or maybe you don't know that you're going to like it. And then on the other side, to use your, your, your purpose, your why, like what really gets you going, use your purpose as your bouncer is, is like, if, when I was starting out and I was desperate to get some work, when I started my business, I took a course, I, I started teaching a course in oral communications. It's totally just like telling story. I brought all my story stuff into the class. You know, it, it worked really, really well. And then they said, oh, will you teach marketing and communications? And I'm like, oh, yes, I could do that. <laughs> Would I want to do that? Is that something that really drives me? No. And it was really hard to say no because I needed the money at that point. But because I said no, a month later when a really interesting story gig came up for me, I could say yes. So you have to have a bit of that faith of leaving the room for the yeses. So if you if I'd said yes to that marketing course, I would have been kicking myself. Like we it's it's a balance. We have to make money, but leaving room for for the stuff that really is part of why. Yeah. Lots of questions. Yes. Um, I, I apologize if I'm a negative Nelly. I, I just wanted to throw out an alternate perspective um, that like, I saw the pandemic kill so much of the arts community. And I saw my brother lose his job um, and try and support his family on, on serve. And um, you know, last week or this week, Cup Red <laughs> announced that they're going under, and before that, Quest Music announced that they're closing, and we lost so many local businesses. Like mm -hmm. I see artists dying, mm -hmm. and um, and it's so sad. And I I feel like like I, I love your 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 exercise at the beginning and what is my life telling me? The idea of purpose as a bouncer, I think that's such a privilege that a lot of people don't have to be able to survive. And with the cost of life going up so much, like somebody said to me recently that my job is killing me. And that's why I'm here is because I want to live my why. But we have to beat ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And and it's this power struggle and it's this balance that I'm gonna have to figure out, which is why I'm here. And and um but um I I think what I'm saying is I would love your perspective on that power struggle on like doing what you love versus like so many artists didn't survive where we have to do jobs that to make a warm raised friend and five dollar pencil of this, you know, and it's such a privilege to follow this, and that's kind of heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Right. I just done. <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, should I? Yeah. Recap. Uh, I, I just because I'm a mic'd individual, I would do my best to, to just share for those on Zoom what you had shared is that the uh, at the crux of it, so many artists have lost everything or close to everything, and that it is entirely heartbreaking to be in that place of, you know, we cannot follow our bliss because we need to feed ourselves, we need to pay rent, we need to do all of these things. And so uh, your, I think your, your question at the heart of it was how, how do we get to that place or what are the things, and maybe we're gonna talk a bit more about like the diver diversifying of income um, so that it, it is feeding that, that why, it is feeding that the, the art that we want to be putting out in the world and making. Is, it, is that fair to summarize? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think like if I look at my career from graduating out of university, kind of working in restaurants all the time. And then, you know, there was a point where my, like I was working in a restaurant a hundred percent and then I was working there maybe 50% and I could, the other 50, I was doing this thing I love. And I was, it was that constant struggle. And I remember so many times pandemic or not, leaping and trying oh, i'm gonna be a muralist that's all i'm gonna do you know you do two murals and you can't find any more murals it's like okay i'll go work at moxie's <laughs> and and so i did that five times maybe six times mm -hmm. and so i think it's sort of like uh it does make me sad to know that lots of creative people it stopped them doing something but i think like if you I mean, it's 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 certainly difficult to like to be doing great and then be not doing great and then doing great and not be doing great. And I think that's sort of the the nature of freelance for me is these peaks and valleys that happen so much. And uh, I think it's just like I guess eventually the resilience of to like if you're really passionate about something to pick yourself up again and to keep going. And uh, like I remember this last time jumping into freelance and you know my wife and kids my house you know all the things that are the pressures of life right and I had to be really calculated it was like okay you know for six months I'm going to have 50 percent of my income come from my creative side and the other half be a, a, a job and and I was like setting myself goals making sure my cal calendar was sort of populated with things that could get me money, like populating it in the future too, like three months, six months in advance. If I knew if, if that calendar was full, I knew I, I could sustain myself. So I think that's like planning and um, being able to do that time management is helpful too. Uh, but it's not easy. I, the, I mean, the running joke, even when Andrina and I were here first, we were like, we we're talking about yeah, join us in, you know, in a job in arts and culture. You can make tens of dollars. <laughs> um, it's not. How to spend $1,000, uh, how to spend thousands of dollars to create a product that's free. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, and I, I just, I just bought a, like a thousand dollars worth of super fun t-shirts only because I sold a thousand dollars worth of t-shirts not that long ago. I'm thinking maybe I could. I could do give it another run, you know, and these little investments along the way are tough to decide whether they're good or not. And um, it, it is a real, it is a real struggle, but what, what I think on the good side of it is you become sort of a, a master of your own timeline. And like, there's a point in my, when my kids were small where I could make them waffles, I could walk them to school um, and all those beautiful things that I couldn't have done nine to five, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, so I think for me, that's where the, the balance is. I know just one last thing with, um, again, Al Simmons, he said, there's three things. He's like, it's got to make you money. You, you got to learn something. Um, what's the other one? Money, learn something. Is there happiness in there or no? Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. And he said, if, if it's too... It's so serious, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah nice. um, so the, he said, as long as there's two of those three things, you're good, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's very 
very simple, simplified, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, maybe we can uh, sort of drill down on maybe, I don't know if it, this will yield specific things or not, but uh, so much during the pandemic was offered for free, which is incredible um, because we needed to like be taking things in. But how how can we now move forward in a, in a I put this in hard air quotes, po post pandemic uh, world uh, and and make money as artists and and how do we sell our our art and our, ourselves for what we're worth um, in contrast to so much that was kind of delivered for free, which again is, is incredible to be able to take that in. But how do we move forward and make money? How do we make money in different ways? Can I just? Yeah. I have to. I have to address the grief yeah. just a little bit because I really appreciate you bringing that up. And I think in a sense, it'll, it weaves in. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have time in that first keynote to, I, I actually had a little section called, it's okay to grieve. And I just didn't have time to put it in. But when I left, um, when I left my work as, as a musician, that was something that I thought I would always, always do, always do. And when I left it to take a full-time job, it, it was really, really hard. And I did. I had two little kids, and we knew we were going to have braces. And my and my partner's a guitar maker, and <laughs> so we we're both self-employed. Um, and and I think it's really important to hold the grief and to hold the grief of what people have lost in terms of being able to dance on stage, make theater together, and touring has become such a difficult thing. All those things, like not to lose that sense of grief. And to be able to sit with the loss. But if there's any people who can show us the way forward, it's people who value creativity and, and, and find ways to find new paths. And just li listening to how like how we've all stitched together our living, part of that is like it comes out of a hard place. Um, but we we are like I am I'm convinced that musicians are going to find a way like damn Ticketmaster and 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 all those things that are going on that you will continue to find a way to make music. We will continue to find a way to do stuff. So create like to me to 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 not lose that creative core, whether it's in your job or somewhere else. And yeah, we can't always do something that we that we totally love. Um, uh, and I have grieved a number of leaving a number of things behind. Um, and yeah, you can hold that. And, and I still think connect and yeah, it is a privilege to make your living, uh, on, on work. I also know from years living in Toronto as a musician, man, I learned how to live with so little. <laughs> yes, I have dumpster dived. I have worked as a new mo nude model. That was really uncomfortable and cold a lot of times. <laughs> um, I transcribed. I, I never did the waiter thing. I did the secretary sort of ghetto. I've done lots of jobs to support the work that I've done. I feel incredibly blessed right now that mostly I get to do what, what I want to do. And someday I might have to shift again. Uh, so I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to, um, to say that. And then... Uh, that other question around how to make things free into, into monetizing it, I think the way that I, I do a couple of things. I have a lot of sliding scales for things I do, uh, like, like Yvette, I work a lot with nonprofits, but I also work in business, so I'm able to help monetize by um, charging the government of Manitoba more money than I do a tiny nonprofit. Um, and but also part of it is to be really clear that what I have to offer is is my special sauce or whatever you want to call it the how <laughs> of what I do that I have what I, that what I have to offer is really valuable and um, if people really want it let's find a creative way to make it happen but this is the way I make a living mm -hmm. so uh, yeah so. That's that's not really clear. I'm sure that you have better answer to that one. <laughs> not, I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's a lot of things floating in my head right now because I feel like art, well, art never dies. You know, the artists don't ever stop being artists. Um, 
and to touch a bit on what you were saying too, like it's it's hard doing what we do. It's hard a lot of the time. And you know, I think as a freelance worker too, I have to constantly remind myself, like I'm always operating in this place of like, what if nothing ever comes to me again? So I say yes to everything. And then I'm totally overextended and I'm not focusing on what I want to be focusing on. And so it's like constantly managing the awareness of burnout with the output that I have and then filling in with other jobs to survive. It's been a part of my story like forever really, but um in a world that's digitizing music and that's streaming it it's like even i'm making an album and there's people that will say you know albums are not a thing anymore it's we live in a singles world and it's like but i want to make an album <laughs> and also it's just like the world keeps changing and who knows in 10 years what it's going to be like uh monetizing art like i really don't know what the answer is to that mm -hmm. i think that we cut we come from our experience we have what we have to offer and like you were saying it's like um how i've gotten here has it has taken the time it has but i'm only here because of everything that i've done and that has is valuable um and so you know in order to access that there's there's a price there's you know mm -hmm. and of course it's like i love to also give my time where I can and help different organizations in whichever ways that I can. I volunteer a lot of my time. And if I feel like that's what I need to do because I have received that mentorship or that, you know, it's all part of it, but it's, it's a tough question. I mean, I, I constantly see the music industry as a taller and higher and harder mountain that feels like, you know, some days it's like, why am I doing this? <laughs> and then other days it's like, yeah, let's go conquer the world. Like music is powerful and beautiful and great. And like, mm -hmm. and, and, and music is, nothing will ever take away from that. But it is, it is, it is tough. It's like, we, we put so much money, we write so many grants, we, you know, wear so many hats to do what we do. Mm -hmm. And the payoff is that we have fun and we bring joy and we bring art into the world but it it costs us our emotional selves as well to do that mm -hmm. um but yeah monetizing i mean i think that things should also be free like something that i loved about the pandemic and doing these online shows and being able to offer this was accessibility that wasn't yeah. there before people who can't necessarily leave their homes people who live in rural areas people who don't have access to this like social culture that we've created um it was a really beautiful thing and there's parts of that that I hope don't end but there's also that human contact that I think is so necessary for for me and you know for art you know being in front of an audience for the first time after years was like almost tear inducing because it's it is an exchange. It's never about what one person is bringing. It's about what people are creating collectively. So, um, I mean, I, I kind of hate that money and art are in constant battle. Yeah. I hate that. It, it feels defeating sometimes, but mm -hmm. it's the reality. And I think that there's, you know, power in numbers and power in uh, uplifting each other and, and, buying a super fun t-shirt when we can, you know, like, you know, our little part, our little part. Uh, just to throw to the Zoom, is yeah. there kind of a Zoom question, which is actually kind of related to what you're uh, saying, Andrea. Um, so Eric says, um, we're talking about living within systems that make things more difficult. In theater and industry that doesn't make money, mm -hmm. we subsist on grants and donations. We're competing with each other for limited resources. Any thoughts on how we might be able to work together to change those systems so we're co cooperating rather than competing? And then Eric follows up to say, um, there are ways uh, we can, instead of monetizing things, look at the systems that govern us. Um, so my question is whether that there are things in your lives that might offer insight on how we might that might happen, how we might offer survive doing the things we love and offer them for free 
I know that's a huge question. How has it changed the world? The world. The literal world. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts? <laughs> like um speaking, if I put my visual artist hat on, uh going through university, you kind of like you're almost making art under an umbrella that protects you from the rest of the world where you can make anything. And uh and then you're kind of, well, maybe I could apply for grants to do that, to make the anything I want to make. But even that has accountability. And like, I think the granting system today, you ha really have to um, outline what you're going to do and check off all the boxes that are important to the institution at that time. So I think it's like, um, there's the idea that you could just be making art for free and, and surviving, which like... A, as the talk of a living wage that everyone has. But um, but I also think that, you know, this, this of the world we live in, the system, uh, as an artist, I know that if I, if I have an, uh, a handmade object, I can sell one of versus uh, I can design something or make something that I could sell a hundred of, um, that I can reach more people with it. And then I can also survive a little easier so it's for me the, that struggle between uh, artists and design, I guess, is a thing that makes well, like when we, that question that Eric said there um, makes me think of like if you're like if you're a maker, if you're making things. I don't know how that applies to theater though. That's sort of out of my. Um, uh, but I know that with with the art I'm making, I know the music side would never, I would never be able to generate enough income to make a living from that. Nor if I was just to make oil paintings, I would never be able to generate enough income to make a living doing that. I could, I could sit in my studio and make art all day long and it'd be really, it'd feel really good. But unless you're looking at where these, if you're a maker, where are these things going? Um, I think you're going to be, it, it will fail and then you'll have to fail and then start again, fail and then start again. And I mean, that doesn't sound fun, but, <laughs> but for instance, like um, I have this, I had this one painting reproduced in a calculus textbook and every year or so they say, Hey, James, we're printing 50,000 copies. And so I go to the Carfax schedule, which if you guys know anything about Carfax, it's like an artist union that gives you a fee schedule to what to charge people because like what do you charge someone for a, a thumbnail of a painting and um so i look up the schedule and, oh that'll be 279 dollars here's the invoice and they pay me and then a year later it happens again and or a, 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 a hallmark movie comes through and they're looking for a bunch of paintings to put in the background of some of their you know it's it's those kind of things that you don't think will be income but i think like in just in trying to bring it back to the question of how do we start selling or how do we survive or how do we monetize some of these things? Um, like one is multiples. So it's the idea of you make a bunch of something, uh, you can reach more people. Um, the other is like, you know, being a little creative with where your art appears or, or who your clients are like, uh, I made a song about eggs, so I contacted the Manitoba egg farmers, and they gave me money. <laughs> like it's it it seemed ridiculous. Like that shouldn't work, you know. <laughs> or uh, I did a a book of drawings using a certain kind of pen, uh, a Sakura jelly roll. So I emailed Sakura and said, you know, I love your pens, and I made a book using your pens. And then they sent me a whole bunch of pens. So it's like, I don't know if that makes, I don't know if that's a tip. I'm hoping like some of what comes from this is, you know, you make a note that maybe mm -hmm. makes you realize there's another spot that you can find a little something, you know, but I find like, if you look at my taxes, it's, you know, here's, here's 30 clients that I rely on every year and I make sure they know I exist. So I'm, there's that, but then it's, the objects you're making and trying to sell them and give them to galleries and give them to stores and um it's a it's a lot of uh you need a lot of hats yet hats change world yeah 
Yeah, that's changed. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't know, like, I don't know, like, the, the the absolute ins and outs of all of this. But if I could lobby for one thing, it would be universal basic income. Yes. Yeah. I just yes. think, like, wow. Wow. wow, just like the level of anxiety in the world, the amount of art that could be made, the amount of people who could pursue their passions, mm -hmm. like, sign me up, you know, I, I, I just think it would be such a, that, that's such a hindrance to art is, is money. And like the fear of where it will come from, regardless of how brilliant you can be at your craft you know mm -hmm. and it's like even success is not even sometimes a, a result of of uh of talent it's sometimes circumstance or whatever you know it's just i just wish that that creativity wasn't hindered by that and i wish i had the answers mm -hmm. but universal basic income seems like a pretty good place to start mm -hmm. Um, I would like to thank the three of you for sharing today. I'd like to thank you for sharing and for Zoomies for sharing as well. Um, we are going to be moving into our lunch period, uh, but uh, I would like to maybe put a, a small bow on this uh, discussion in a way that there won't ever be one answer. There won't ever be one solution, uh, but it is incredibly powerful to get together in a room full of people and talk about those things. Mm -hmm. um, so even if this takes you to a different conversation with somebody else in your life, or if it takes you to the uh, Guaranteed Basic Income website and you hop on that petition and say, yes, please, um, there, you know, these, these things are all connected and uh, trickle down into other places in your life. So thank you so much for, for uh, being our first panel of the, the day. Uh, and for Zoomies at home, we're going to come back uh, around 1.35 um, after our lunch. Um, thank you. 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 Thank you.